feature film, of course. Uh, the national narratives are built in the colonies and then brought back home. Um, this has been happening since the arrival of Columbus to the Americas. Uh, I'll give an example. The police in Europe, as we know it today, was instituted first in the American colonies, and then once it was a well-oiled machine, the whole mechanism was brought back to the continent. Uh, the Dutch police, for example, um, the first tentative police force uh, for the Netherlands was instituted in Suriname so that um, there could be a force to control the enslaved people. And then when that was uh, deemed to be efficient and good enough, the same mechanism of policing as we know it now with uh, the concomitant um, racial profiling and the, the very strict divisions of property owners and versus uh, laborers, all of that was brought back to the Netherlands. Of course, there was police before that, there was some form of policing, but I'm talking about um, the very sleek and modern conception of police. The same goes with the uh, police in the US. The first police forces um, in the American continent were the patrols, uh, where every white person could be deputized to um, harass black people where they, whether they were free or enslaved. And that mechanism of deputizing white people in detriment of, of black people and other um, people of color was then re-imported back into the continent. Uh, the French did the same thing in Algeria. The French police um, sort of improved their methods of policing in the colony of Algeria. And when you ask us where are the national narratives built, well, they are built in these um, interstices of the colonial power. And then that colonial power defines, um, I, I would say, the national character which is then reproduced at home with the, the colonial uh, system, but then applied domestically. So um, a lot of the things that Franco did in Spain, um, they had al already, th those methodologies had already been, um, yeah, tried and tested in Morocco. And prior to that, I would even go as far as saying, in the Latin American colonies as well. And what Franco did was perfect a form of militarization of civil society that had already be been implemented elsewhere. And if you look at all the colonial powers in, in Europe, the, the Netherlands, why do I talk about the Netherlands? M my work has been very much devoted to unpacking and uh, to dissect in the way that these colonial powers have operated always in this country, because this is where I live. But there are the same patterns can be observed in France, in the UK, in Germany even. And Germany has its own um, peculiar story with, with World War II, but if you look at that instance as well, uh, all the technologies of mass genocide have been already tested in Namibia, and in what is now present-day Kenya with um, the native populations. They are the first uh, concentration camps as they were later on deployed by the Nazis were used um, in Namibia and tested the, the methods of eugenics and population control were tested there first and then brought back to Germany, repurposed and applied to the local Jewish and Roma and black populations. So my argument is that uh, the national narratives are always built against an other through which the colonizer defines um, him or herself. And without the presence of that other through which we define the national identity, um, there will be very little left of that um, 
fictional construction because let's not forget that these national identities are also part of larger projects of fictional narrators where we, and I, I say we as me living here in the Netherlands, again, to use this as an example, where we define ourselves uh, in regards to others. Uh, without that fiction, there is very little left in terms of um, the, how to build a system that capitalism requires of this other in order to function, and, and colonialism has set the basis for that. So I don't know if I can answer where are the national narratives built, but I will insist I believe that the national narratives are built paradoxically elsewhere and then brought back so that the local population has a mirror, which is, again, I insist, a fictional mirror to reflect itself upon. And, and I think that your film has done a very good job of actually illustrating how this has been going on as basically since the Crusades. And I, I found it very, very interesting. Uh, I don't know if that's what that was your objective, but that's the way I read it. And of course, I'm a biased observer because all of this is uh, what I teach myself <laughs> uh, in, in critical studies. So thank you, and I'm going to pass the mic to someone else. Uh, thank you. This was uh, very inspiring because um, uh, I'm from Portugal and uh, Portugal has a very similar history and I, I'm very interested in this layer. So basically like the question of racialization as occurring inside the nation state, not outside the nation state. Uh, and uh, the question of racialization as in connected with land ownership because in Portugal too, uh, you have this division between the latifundio and minifundio. So basically, like you have the south that is uh, on, you know, like there's like really vast uh, um, land uh, uh, properties uh, uh, where there is like a landed gentry, and there's the north that is divided in small plots. And uh, this, uh, you know, like signifies the the you know like who gets a share, right? And who gets a share is, of course, like the northern population because they are of a different uh, ethnicity than the southern population. And, and this is really like connected to the founding of the, na you know, like this is the nation. The nation is, uh, you know, like this uh, knights that just like uh, drive downwards with great ferocity and just like slaughter all the population that they encounter uh, and also like take ownership of their land and uh, the the ownership will be somewhat distributed you know like in the north of the province but not in the south of the province and then you have this like you know color line that is never addressed as such but I think that uh, it, it's really present it's also really present in civic life it's also present in political life it's also present in cultural life uh, that there is an overrepresentation of, uh, you know, like the ethnicity that rules the country that has certain physical characteristics, and there is an underrepresentation of the ethnicity that was dispossessed and remains up until today completely disenfranchised and, yeah, marginalized from, not only marginalized from land ownership and other kinds of ownership, but also marginalized from any kind of like cultural or uh, social presence. Uh, of any kind of like um, weight uh, and uh, I mean you know like in Spain you can see it too it's quite visible in Portugal you know like you really have this uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> you really have this this uh, di you know like dividing line uh, you know like that cuts the peninsula quite you know like halves the peninsula so to say uh, I also thought it was um, super interesting what you brought up, like the question of the concrete, right? Because, uh, you know, Franco, um, he, you know, like the, the real estate speculation during the Franco era was intense. 
and uh, in the building, you know, like uh, all of this like uh, uh, intense building of like uh, uh, these concrete blocks uh, really began during the Francoist regime. So basically, not later, because I think like in, m we all now tend to think that this all began in the you know like late 80s, you know, like when you had this real estate boom, but actually began uh, much earlier. And this is super interesting to me because, you know, like fascism always operates this distinction between industrial capital and financial capital, you know, like that's basically what fascism is, is like the, uh, how to say, attempt to uh, separate two types of capital and say industrial capital is good and financial capital is bad. And of course, like we are pro-industrial capital and we are against financial capital, which is speculative and therefore uh, dissipative and not productive. Uh, but actually, like with Franco, you can see it clearly, like how much, uh, you know, like uh, fascism is invested in, in financial speculation. So basically how the whole country, like the whole economy of the country is structured around uh, this question of like, uh, you know, like using real estate as a tool to speculate and to create speculative value. Uh, and again, you know, like the racial dimension that uh, is imbricated into this because, uh, again, who gets to own this new apartment blocks, you know, like that um, are built in the places where the former campesinos were expropriated. I mean, not beyond expropriated, they were just slaughtered. Like they, they are no more. Uh, so like, yeah, I, f I found this um, uh, extremely fascinating because also like I'm, I'm very interested in these continuities between fascism and colonialism. And uh, uh, it's very seldom that one sees this question addressed of like the, you know, like the inner colonialism, you know, like inside the European nations, like the populations that uh, are, le let's say, patient zero, right? Uh, and I mean, you know, like maybe this is going on a tangent, but um, uh, one can probably like think of the Irish as like really patient zero of the whole British Empire, right? And also like uh, patient zero of the entire expansionary trajectory of the Western Empire is because, uh, you know, like you really, s you know, like the process of British colonization really starts in Ireland. And, uh, you know, like I, I think that probably for every Euro European country you could see, you know, like patient zero is already located inside the territory of a nation state. Uh, and then, you know, like it expands to the colonies and boomerangs back and, you know, like this whole, you know, like there's this kind of like diabolical uh, feedback loop that just keeps building on, you know, like on, on, on and on and on and on. Um, shall I pass on the mic? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, I thought it was quite an interesting work. I mean, there's a lot said already. I agree with, I think uh, Flavia touched upon something that is, you know, um, that gets very close in proximity to um, unraveling also what the question uh, proposes. Um, and I also think one with that, the um, border politics, of course, touch attached to it, like with the, um, I would say, uh, formation of the co colonial um, and slavery. For me, the two are very much tied together. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's like a project of like what four centuries, four and a half, five centuries, and in a way, what is quite interesting then to me is the kind of inter intensifying colonial project came with the performance of borders. So the Berlin Conference in 1884 um, also made Europe perform its perfected borders elsewhere, and then perform the borders in interiorly. So what, what to me is very interesting then, um, what does that mean in Southern Europe? What does that look like? How I thought it was nice that you in a way somehow collapsed some the sentiments of the di dictatorship or the fascist project of Franco with colonialism, because to me they're two different sides of the same coin. I mean, at the core of it, we're also talking about dictatorial regimes that are, in a way, racializing, putting people into property, like using similar tools. And in a way, 
um, uh, Flavia perfected that. I must say, though, I, I don't necessarily, I think I, I would say, just to kind of also respond to, to what has been said, um, often has been said about the Irish as a um, kind of patient zero. I think there have been many patient zeros. I think uh, in, in when one thinks of the British, one has to also think of the Americas as a colon, the initial colonial project. Maybe we should say the indigenous people to the lands were maybe patients zeros. Um, and um, um, just to kind of uh, get back to um, this idea of the border and also the end of the world. Uh, uh, um, being sometimes in the interior, in the mundane, in the boring piece of land um, that is um, like almost disregarded or like, you know, like the considered a trash uh, left aside. And I thought it was also interesting, this idea of roaming and the role of sound. I thought it was quite maybe not, not intentional, not intentional, I thought. <laughs> Um, as a listener, as a viewer, it was for me quite interesting to kind of incorporate or like uh, process the sound, kind of um, what does it mean to um, listen to uh, where our, na our national narratives build? Like how does that, that, you know, how do you trace while listening instead of, you know, um, bringing out or, or re like, coming up with some sort of theoretical framework. What does it mean to actually put your um, embodied listening to it, like different forms of listening? And I was also quite interested in, um, in that particular landscape and listening to that landscape, just as a sonic uh, uh, um, act or exercise. And... Um, um, yeah, I, I was also thinking about the the last thing I was going to say of what does it mean for us then to perform these borders, to embody these borders and um, borders as sites or landscapes where nation, the nation is built. And I think here again is um, what, what Flavia said about like um, that you need someone else, you need somehow the borders as kind of fix, fix, fictive. Uh, a limitation or the end of the imagination of what the nation is um, because beyond that something else starts and that else could endanger the potential and the ways of being in the nation and performing the nation and putting the nation to work so and and to kind of using the the, the privileges of citizenship and everything that is attached to that type of economic um, system economic, oppressive, violent system um, that is the apparatus that's put, put and policed. And again, I guess, what does it mean to, to abolish? It means also to almost disregard the question. Like in order to kind of step aside, it means you almost have to let go of the question. I was, that was something I was thinking about. We need to set up. Uh, if you could bring the chairs to the side because we don't need them in space. Uh, uh? And, um, what did I want to say? Ah, we might have to skip the coffee break later because we're running really late and we would want to finish today <laughs> with everyone.
it's intended to project here onto the latex covered mirror. And the whole setting was originally intended to perform in a darker environment. That's it.
没有大气，没有了头颅，没有衣服，没有照在皮肤上的阳光。我的马在哪里？我的马死了。无法向前看。
Where do plants come from? Where do organics come from? Tracing origins is terribly boring. Listen, the surface of the machines, skyscrapers, they are spreading, inhabiting. They are coming. From circuits, wires, semiconductors, quantum reactors. Um, thank you for um, quite a daunting piece of work in the sense that it's quite a, there's a lot in it um, to unpack and unravel. Um, somehow I was also reading your um, blurb, the, the small write-up, and I was thinking um, this, I was very interested in, in kind of processing um, the because it, it is part of the myth, right? Like the myth of the ten sons where one son is left because nine of the other sons are shut down uh, as a, it's, it's part of a Chinese myth. And um, where he should, where, um, I forgot the name of the, uh, the god that turned human that shut down nine of the ten sons. And um, I was really thinking about um, the metaphor that is hidden in that, and then in the small write-up, you were you uh, brought forward um, the Anthropocene, and um, I have to say, I I thought the um, the the soundscape was a very interesting piece of work as a kind of the way it, it sometime um, um, was in the shadow and the other times came to the forefront, um, almost occupying more space than the visual, the visual uh, work. And I was really um, thinking about the work of, uh, yeah, Françoise Ferge, the, um, the decolonial um, French feminist, or the decolonial feminist who lives and works mostly in France. She wrote um, on quite a known text called um, Racial Capitalism, 
And in a way, I felt that some of the topics you were touching on in the work touched on what she was writing. And she writes um, um, a critique on the Anthropocene. And to me, already the critique starts with once I was attending um, a talk with where someone asked in a lot of words, quoting a bunch of dead white men, um, what, what she thought about the, the Anthropocene. And then she said, um, how can we have this conversation when so many of us are not human yet? And for me, that kind of lies the core of the critique of the Anthropocene. But I'm also very curious, what does that then mean in a context, in a space, in a, a, a country which is carrying the burden of a lot of the uh, um, disposable workers, um, like the human waste, carrying the burden also of producing um, so much of the stuff the world needs or desires as part of the capitalist machine. And at the same time, I was very interested in, it seemed as if the route you're, just to kind of process what I was seeing and hearing simultaneously, I was really thinking, is this, was this maybe a moving from the exterior into um, like maybe a hinterland or I don't know where, what, what the site could have been this unknown place into the city where the, uh, the weather changed into like very dramatic, uh, um, accompanied by the, by the sound. I was, that was one thing that came up and I really thought um, in relation to the nine sons that were gone and then that one son that was left um, to return to your question, what returns? I think what returns perhaps the, the, the human waste under the sun, um, but that's my <laughs> interpretation. Um, I, I was really, I had one thing that I wanted to bring forward was, um, as someone who's very interested in sound, I really, really thought the, the soundscape was quite poetic, but I was also thinking about what do certain symbolism mean in particular, particular cultures? I saw the red, the red hand, I was thinking about is that, like just, just to process some of it, like because the symbolism red means something else in China than where my parents are from, and it means something else in, in perhaps elsewhere in the world. Um, and the type of violence that is attached to the color red in the context. And the last thing I was gonna say was um, what was a bit difficult for me to process was also um, the performative, the, the ending performance, and that had to do with um, the close proximity it has with kind of um, people being lynched, people being, you know, hanged, like the type of violence attached to particular symbolism. So I was just, that was one, that was one thing that came for me at the end that was a bit uh, something to reckon with. Let me just call it that. Thank you um, for the film and the performance. I'm losing my voice already, which is a good thing for you, <laughs> for all of you. Um, I found it a pretty difficult piece. I really enjoyed the, uh, the film, the, the visuals, but I struggled to connect to uh, the, th the whole uh, piece emotionally. Um, I think that there was an element of um, what Amal referred to in, in regards to the feminist uh, critique of Anthropocene. I felt that this was purposefully uh, maybe very masculine, and I, that's not necessarily bad. I don't mean it like a negative critique, just I think that that was an obstacle for me to connect to it. And I was perhaps uh, reading the introduction, I was expecting a more fantastic um, elements or, or more fantastic presence in, in the film. And it was very gritty and, and uh, the visuals, 
had not so much correlation to what I was expecting in regards to the sun. I really, really liked, like Amal said, the soundscape. I think that that alone uh, makes the whole piece. And uh, I think that when you talk about in your uh, introduction, when you say uh, attempting to bash this imperial narrative of subjectivity and identity, and for me, I was expecting that that would include uh, doing away with certain uh, aspects of more hegemonic masculinity. But that performance at the end was like a reinforcement of that masculinity. What um, Amal mentioned that it um, gave her uh, an impression or a sensibility uh, associated with a certain form of violence. I also got that, not in the same way like with her, but in a sense of associating that figure that roams uh, with a very patriarchal, um, very strong and, yeah, in a sense, imperial uh, presence. However, I don't know if the idea was to um, deconstruct that or to leave it standing. That's up to you to answer. I'm not asking, of course, these are, as a critic, the things that a priori I see. Um, that said, of course, uh, it, the, the piece had so many interesting elements uh, visually, and these are just my a priori comments on a first viewing. I'm sure that if I look at more, I will find other details uh, to focus on. But uh, sonically, I was Im very, very impressed as well. Hi. Uh, no. Oh, yes. Hi, Giotto. Uh, thank you. This was really compelling. And um, I, I find uh, this story fascinating. If I would have to take a guess, I would say this is a narrative of empire building, of centralization of power like the nine suns get slayed so that one only one sun can shine only one sun can stand and uh, and that leads to you know peace and prosperity for all under the benevolence of the sovereign uh, i i think this is uh, i mean again i'm just taking a guess uh, at the same time that the Chinese empire was being monetized, right, the economy of the Chinese empire was being monetized, the Europeans were uh, expanding uh, their colonial uh, uh, empires into the new world. So basically, like all the natives that were being entombed in the mines uh, were um, providing silver and gold that was, you know, like functioning as the means through which the Chinese empire could monetize its economy. Uh, you know, like, so you know, I, I think that it's interesting because this is usually like the, um, the part that one leaves out, uh, you know, like the part that one leaves out in this like first wave of globalization is uh, to which, to, to what end was the silver and gold that was coming from the mines of South and Central America deployed. And uh, that was of course deployed to empire building in the other end of the world. Um, then you connect this to the Anthropocene, which um, I also found intriguing. And um, there I, I would see quite a leap because, um, you know, like it's as if you are like superimposing uh, a new allegory into this allegory. Uh, and um, yeah, basically I, I would, see in this like a comment perhaps uh, on this transition that is uh, engineered in the 19th century where we leave an economy that is based on uh, energy flows so basically like solar cycles and we enter an economy that is based on energy stock on the consumption of energy stock so you know like that would be like fossil capitalism and what then leads to the Anthropocene um, and there again, you know, like I stumble a bit on the on the question of the ten sons and the nine sons, and I wonder if you uh, mean to uh, talk about like all of these blazing furnaces 
uh, you know, like the power of the steam engines and then the first industrial revolution and, and you know, like if this is a common on, you know, like again, you know, like this kind of like uh, um, explosion of power and powers uh, all over the world, uh, you know, basically like leading us to the present situation. Um, but again, you know, like I'm just taking guesses. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would like to get back a bit to the gear of last year. So, because otherwise Saskia is not to perform tonight. So we have to uh, be...
Multiplicity of Resonant Disruption, Act 1, Cacophony, curated by Raphael Dybert and Zachary Schoenert. Hello, Netherlands. Can you hear us? Multiplicity of Resonant Disruption is a sound installation in two acts, considering the insurrectionary force of sounds, voices, and reverberating forms of communication of trans and queer individuals across the world. Radio Codepike served the Dutch government in the management and continued con colonization of Indonesia vis-a-vis -vis sound and radio waves. The radio transmitter directly implemented Western technologies of communication and control, strengthening the colonial presence throughout Southeast Asia. Quite literally, the first statement that was ever transmitted via radio waves from Radio Codepike was, hello, Bandung, do you hear me? By Queen Mother Hema in 1929. Immediately, Indonesia was subjugated by a foreign entity through the resounding interpolation of the singular pronoun, me. On the information website for ra the Radio Code Bike, it is noted that the surroundings were chosen for the undisturbed connections. These surroundings and the colonial history that it holds must be punctured and interrupted, fully unmasked and interrogated. In Act 1, Cacophony, the multitude of sonic vibration form a language of refusal that amplify the marginalized sonic activist archives of Brazilian artist Mavi Veloso, remixed with Morse code and sounds of personal archives. The sonic interplay ruptures the architectural and historical silencing of the space. Mavi's works include a multiplicity of transgender women voices from across time and space. Octavia Saint Laurent, Bambola Star Kashinawa, Lorenza Butner, Venus Extravaganza, Pepper La Beja, Jennifer Laude, and others. In Mavi's own words, when the conventions try to silence us, we cheat. When tradition try to, tries to do harm, we fight. When violence insists on hurting, we resist. Give a warm applause.
Olá, bom dia Brasil, boa tarde Itália. Olá, bom dia Brasil, boa tarde Itália. Bom dia Brasil, bom dia Itália. Olá, bom dia Brasil, boa tarde Itália. This is me. You understand? No, I'm not a woman. No, I am not a man. I am Octavia. Vögel haben mir schon immer fasziniert, von der Leichtigkeit, von der Freiheit wegzufliegen, wo sie hin sie wollten. Und das war immer so, dass wenn ich zur Schule gegangen bin, da bin ich so unter ein Hochspannungsmaß vorbeigegangen und habe mich nach oben gesehen und dann habe ich die Federn runterkollern sehen. Und dann habe ich gesagt, nach oben muss ein Nest mit, wie sagt man, Nestlinge sein und das gehst du irgendwann mal holen. Was passiert ist, was man mir erzählt hat, weil ich erinnere mich nicht mehr dran. Ich erinnere mich, dass ich mich bis vor den Pfosten gewesen bin und danach nichts mehr. I think if I could just be on TV or film, I did that. I did that. I did I I just want to be a rich somebody. <laughs> Olá, bom dia Brasil, boa tarde Itália. Everything you do in life is like a book. Ich wach den Krankenhaus auf, sechs Stunden später auf, also ich war in Ohnmächtig. Nach drei Tagen, wo man versucht hat, also alle Mögliches zu retten, weil es, die Arme waren ja verkohlt, bis zum am... und weiter, also stark verbrennen und weiter oben. Extra. Uh, hat man mich nach Santiago de Chile gebracht sensitive. und uh, da hat man mich operiert. Uh, da erstmal nur bis zum Ellbogen und dann drei Monate später musste das mal operiert werden, und bis zum ähm, Anfang der Schulter, weil äh, Brand reingekommen ist. Hoffentlich, Gott willing, by 1988, I fully hope to become a full-pledged woman of the United States. Itália, bom dia Brasil! You look at all these models on the wall. Every one of them are gorgeous. Every one of them are beautiful. But every one of them have their own look. And I look at her hair and I'd say she's seductive and she's alluring. I look at her there and I say she's sexy and provocative. I look at her here and I think that she's childish and little girl type, you know? And I look at her here and it's the same. And I look at her here and I think of wicked beauty, you know? That's how I see her. I, I admire her, you know, the, the red hot fire up there. Ja, die Leute gucken so oder so, ob ich ganz gescheit gekleidet bin oder ganz verrückt. Aber ich habe Spaß daran. Ich habe Spaß daran, den Leuten die Augen zu öffnen, wie dumm es ist, sich hinter so bürgerliche Sachen zu verstecken und zurückzuziehen. Na Itália, Roma, quatro anos. Vor dem Unfall hast interessa, du mir Probleme auferlegt, in denen ich merkte, então, dass pronto, du doch anders resolver. warst als die anderen Kinder. Das war für mich ein großes Problem. The only reason why they keep girls like me in the closet is because I'll change everyone's way of thinking about our lifestyle. Personally, I think homosexuals are the most creative, intelligent, and the most social people out there. Yes, we make mistakes, but they make mistakes, 
see people are so busy wasting their time bashing faggots when they can be doing something a lot more positive. These are the people you have to worry about. Our whole fucking world is being run by perverted undercover fags that run around talking about how straight they are. You got big time celebrities that go around in, in, in their cars picking up transvestites, having sex with them and then getting on national TV making fun of them. Everything you do in life is like a boomerang. When you throw it, it eventually comes back. Don't fuck with me. Ich hatte es ja so weit getrieben, dass ich mich angemeldet habe, um eine Operation zu machen, und zwar mich als Frau umzuwandeln. Da habe ich Ihnen die Entscheidung total überlassen, weil ich der Meinung war, dass es er war und es ist seine Person. Und dies war für mich klar, dass der Ernst diese Entscheidung auch für sich, so schwerwiegend wie sie war, musste er sie alleine tragen. Ich habe mir dann noch intensiver Gedanken darüber gemacht, warum ich eigentlich eine Frau sein wollte. Und dann habe ich äh, nur festgestellt, oder bin ich It's reality. Gekommen, you understand, uh, when I take off my clothes, there's no pads or towels falling from my hips. They are my hips. My measurements are 36, 18, 36. None of my girlfriends have my measurements. But I am here. I am here. And nothing can push me aside. Nothing can change what goes on in this world. This world is from the two hundred. And they have to understand that. I have a right to be here just like everybody else. See, their problem is they don't want you to know about me. Because first of all, I get too many dicks hard. Simple as that. Ich habe mich ja deswegen dann auch nicht operieren lassen. Ich habe gesagt, also wenn das der Grund ist, ist es nicht schwer, dass du viel Schmerz und Leid durchzuziehen.
French. Hi, can you see us? Thank you for uh, for this. It was for me. It was very very interesting, and I I was thinking throughout the whole uh, composition. I was thinking in the fifties, during the fifties, at the beginning of the Cold War, uh, there was something called um, number stations. It was. Uh, radio stations that governments like the Dutch government or whichever, the British, the Russians, the, the Americans, they broadcasted numbers and it was encrypted uh, communication. At the other end of the, of, of the radio waves, somewhere in the world, there was someone who had a unique one-off decryption path. Each number in the radio station that was broadcasted represented a letter of the alphabet. The person who had the decryption uh, pad was the only person in the world who could understand the meaning of this broadcast. It was a very old form of encryption and it ran from the 50s until very recently, actually, it's on short waves, sometimes you can still hear uh, number stations. To this day, no number station has ever been decrypted. It has been proved to be the most secure form of communication. Some of them are legendary. Uh, there is one in the UK that uh, until the 80s was broadcasting, and it opened every broadcast with a folk song, a specific folk song. I think it was the Lincolnshire Pouch or something like that. Um, this is the geek in me. I know so much and I shouldn't about this topic. But what I like about the concept of number stations is the idea that only one person who has the decryption pad um, will understand the message at the other end. And that we, and I'm, the reason I know radio stations is because growing up, um, I used to play with a shortwave radio, and I discovered numbers being broadcasted, and I became obsessed. It was much, much later in life when I learned what those numbers were. But what I hear in this composition is with the Morse code and with um, queer communications, I hear an encrypted form of liberatory uh, communication. And that's why I enjoyed it so, so much. Because I thought there is someone out there who has the decryption path for this composition and who will know exactly what is being said. And this composition speaks to them. It speaks to me as well, of course. But in, in my imaginative response, I was thinking of someone who for the first time is uh, exposed to these, maybe a young queer person trying to find like-minded uh, souls, friends, individuals, and coming across this composition. And I thought, well, I hope that it has the same effect that the number station had in me growing up, because it was finding a whole different world that I didn't know about, and look at these, 30 years later, I'm still obsessed. So listening to your composition, I thought about that. This is like encrypted emotion. And I enjoyed it very much as such. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. Um, thank you so much for this, um, Rafael and Zachary. I, I, I just want to say right into the camera, I'm missing you, Epatia. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to sort of, I think it, for me, it poses a lot of questions. I'm going to talk really quickly because I have a lot to say. Um, 
I think it poses the question of what is the sound of colonial command, right? What is that sound? And then it, and it's so, so it stages two series, two multiplicities, uh, the colonial command, but then the, then the multiplicity of what I would call decolonizing hybridity, the sound of subaltern life worlds, the, 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 the life world of queer people, the life, the life world of colonized people, and these are not the same series. And one can jump from one sound series to another sound series, which is what you make us do in this sort of uh, acrobatics of listening, which I found just amazing. And I also, for me, it, it also posed the question of what is the beat beneath the command, um, which I think uh, I'm really excited about. Um, and, and so I, I'm thinking about hybridization and hybridity as a form of colonial resistance. Of course, there's Homi Baba and there's people like Paul Gilroy talking about sound, but then it brings to mind that here in your work, sound is not being used as a, just as a sort of metaphor, because of course, metaphors are what we resort to when we, re, when we forget how to act. And so, and so what it does is actually stage the materiality of sound as a force it stages it for me as a, and, and what I was listening to it as a kind of bringing the intensive difference of sound back into the experience of power, which then brings, I know I'm talking really quickly, I'm sorry, but um, and it brings me back to this question of these two series, the series of command, colonial command, and the series of subaltern life worlds. And what are these two series? They're two series that also stage two different forms of difference the difference of contradiction between colonized and colonizer, and the difference of intensive becoming uh, of, of colonial, colonized life worlds. So that to me, and they're incommensurable, incommensurable forms of difference. Um, I thought of the Tower of Babel and Derrida's idea of the Tower of Babel, and he says interesting things, as he always says these interesting things. Um, but I, then I thought of the relationship of, of cacophony to resonance. And, and to think about resonance as actually a material strategy of resistance, um, which then, you know, sort of brings once again the body back, the body back in, in, in amazing ways. Um, because here, what we're, we're again sort of, I think, in is that the body is in process of listening and that sound is, is not only a material force, but it's a durational force. It's a force of something unfolding, and the body is implicated in it. The body is responding to it, sometimes obviously, sometimes involuntarily, um, unconsciously. But then one can think then of a of a strategy that emerges uh, from that as 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 a force of resistance. So, yay! Thank you. Hi. Um, so I mean, uh, I. I I'm gonna begin with the uh, hey Bandung, do you hear me? <laughs> no, she says hello, of course she wouldn't say hey. Uh, <laughs> of course. Uh, no, because um, you know, when you study media theory, uh, informational theory, they always tell you like that the message is a form of command and the purpose of a message is not to transmit information, it's to elicit a response. And uh, I think that, you know, like this hello Bandung, do you hear me, is, you know, like clearly transporting this, you know, like domineering, you know, command. As in, yeah, you know, of course, uh, you are put in a place where there is no way for you not to hear her. Uh, you know, like you have to hear her. And this re it reminded me of an, a number of things, like for instance, like this, uh, you know, like the the, the this trope uh, uh, of all of this, uh, you know, armchair anthropologists that would say things to the effect, we have no way of knowing whether they can hear us. <laughs> or, uh, you know, another like little anecdote of like um, Bartolomeo de las Casas telling the uh, Native Amer uh, uh, South Americans, uh, this is the word of God, and handing them the Bible, and then like putting it to their ear because, you know, <laughs> if it's the word of God, you should be able to speak it. Uh, anyway, my point and why I'm, you know, like telling all these stupid stories is that um, coding and decoding clearly do not occur or do not need to occur in the same frequency. And, uh, you know, like this, I think, was the way, uh, you know, like post-colonial theory spoke back to media theory. 
and, and basically completely deconstructed this master narrative, you know, this idea that uh, information is a command. Uh, and that, uh, you know, like there is something like completely inescapable and inlutable, like domineering about like the relationship between sender and receiver. And uh, the answer was clearly to say, uh, no, actually, uh, you know, like when, you know, like uh, what, um, what gets decoded on the other end is not necessarily what was intended to be coded. Um, and I, I think that this is really like, you know, what uh, I saw in your work. And then of course, like, thinking about Brazil and the present moment, I couldn't help but also think about the question of the cacophony of voices. Uh, I, you know, like, in relationship to the question of fascism, which obviously is never like a movement that wants freedom for the masses, it's a movement that wants freedom from the masses but you know like somehow always gets misconstrued as a movement that get that wants freedom for the masses uh and and i think that this is also like now um something that uh i mean it's not only very present but also like i think that you know like your uh work refers to that right to you know like all of this uh conflicting you know like all of this uh conflicting voices uh in the public sphere and uh, the, you know, basically the attempt to astroturf uh, some sort of like, uh, again, master narrative uh, or, you know, like an, an attempt to script or to code, uh, you know, according to a master narrative. And uh, I, I made so many notes that are so chaotic that, you know, like, I, I guess that because, you know, I'm remaining truth to the. I'm, I'm remaining truth to the <laughs> spirit of the performance. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, just to end, I would like to say, também a altura da gente se emancipar desta língua imprevista, não é? Thank you.
Yeah. And also change screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, uh, Maxime, also mute yourself when Julia is introducing, yeah? Maxime, also mute yourself when Julia is introducing, just to avoid possible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> no, I did not. No, the screens are small because of the yeah. number of people on the call. Yeah, Sometimes. yeah, I can see you. No, we can see you. Yeah, we can. Ah, that's nice. Back and wave. Hello. No, 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 sí, sí, sí. Maxime Gourdon presents a continuous present beginning again and again with tenses such as past and future. Perhaps Amit S. Ray and Anna Texerapinto and Adam Simcic will respond to the question, is there a time you can look back on? You can't look back on. Perhaps no one ever looked there. No one caressed that place with their eyes before. And you would be the first, sending a look from the past. A look sent to the future, a look that could not be given back. You touch with your eyes, you look. Doing that, you read what happened there or what is going to happen. You inform the future of what happened when you looked. 
a continuous present, beginning again and again with tenses such as past and future. Thank you. So I'm just sharing my screen. A continuous present, beginning again and again, with tenses such as past and future. Is there a time you can't look back on? I would like you to walk in the space with me for a minute as an introduction for listening. Enough time for you to scan the space, its size in relation to yours, and experience distancing bodies in various arrangements. Register the shape of the room it's moving light and flows of air circulating between you all. The withdrawal and release of space around you as you walk. Safe spaces borrowed from common space. I invite you to eventually find a sitting position in the space. Walk, look for a location from which you wish to attend to it, sitting down. Remember the space you just scanned. Raise it. Eyes open. Try to at a distance in space. Think about the location you chose to attend to this space in regards to this place, in this building, in this field. The mandatory spaces between your body and the other bodies and the kind of shape it could make when seen from afar. Realize how your own body enters in contact with the floor, the contact points, the spaces between you and the floor, and the way the folds of your clothes change when you breathe. When you breathe from small breath, to deeper breath, from small breath to deeper breath, and how all this air breathing, all this air flowing down your throat, down to your lungs, this makes you feel slightly dizzy. Breathing from small breath to deeper breath, makes your head spinning, maybe. Anyone is it that I'm breathing regularly without thinking about it? And while you realize it, you breathe regardless. And yet, you're still breathing. Perhaps more irregularly, now that you're thinking about it. And you wonder again, how does thinking about something that I usually do without thinking about it make me do it differently? You always did. Maybe you remember all the moments in the past when you were so conscious about what seemed to be taken for, for, for granted. But perhaps you also remember the moments when you were not or preferred not to. Like in your eyes or moments when you raise your eyebrows with content for listening to someone, moments when you swallow your saliva and you notice it hurts your throat and pressures your ears in a sound that resembles a click. Uh. 
all kinds of things. Yeah. <clears throat> From small breath to deeper breath. This kind of breathing, raising, swallowing, pressuring. This really makes your head spinning. Not just like all the things that you do in a repeated way, but things that you used to do without being so conscious about. All these things that got granted value now through this text and you do with being so conscious about them. Because variation only exists within a multitude of repetitions, just like when you pick a word and repeat it mentally until it's, non until it's not the word anymore. You exhaust meaning until it's only sound, until it's only sound spinning around in your head, spinning. And it's not that the word changes, but you that has changed hearing and saying words in a different way. Let's imagine this applies to people in descriptions that the more you, it's not the thing that changes, but you instead who recombine them in a different way. Moonlighting and the cover and the clear labor that changes you over time. <clears throat> Everything is the same except composition and as the composition is different and always going to be different. Everything is not the same. <clears throat> this is a sentence I remember having read for someone. Do you remember having read for someone as I once did for someone? And I don't mean voicing words for someone like I'm reading for you now, but instead I mean reading for yourself without that someone knowing that you do. And you, reading secretly, regardless. Reading for someone to make the space between you thinner and thinner, to fill in the mandatory spaces. Reading someone else's books to feel that the space between you two is reduced to that of a page. Reduced to the thickness of the paper, the page, vibrating with the sound of your voice. And if we, if one would look carefully, sense carefully enough, one would feel the paper vibrating with the tip of a finger. One would then touch the sound of someone else's voice, caress the tip of its modulations, feel the red grain of someone else's voice, Sharing words and voices brings you virtually close on the space of the same page. Reading words that someone else once read, reading words to urge someone else to read. The two of you reading words to hear what the two of you read, same but differently. Did you read? for someone to get that someone better, to own them, to become them. Breathing for you out loud with their voice as your head's voice, without that someone knowing that you do, of course. Privatizing someone. One might think that one should be able to own someone else's voice, provided that one knows it well enough. It's inflections, modulations, speech and tones, accents. Beyond an imitation, it can be someone else for yourself. <clears throat> and then you might read for someone with someone else's voice, reading in your head, as it could be this person with your head's voice, reading for you as you read for someone else, gazing at the space of the page. Your reflected sight triggers someone else's voice as in a one-way mirror. Kind of a love triangle, warped, 
geometrics without any of these someone really involved it's all in your head it's all for yourself think of it as visiting a place where someone else has lived with the hope that you may have stepped where this person once stepped touched the handle of a door this person may have touched in their life touching the clothes that someone once wore, breathing the same air as this person once did. Geometrics of a never straight line, but instead a triangle, your gaze bounces two times and finally comes back at you. We imagine the kind of diagram it could make when seen from afar. And through these shared experiences, there would be a connection, a hyperlink through time, diverted rays on reflected surfaces that only you would capture. An invisible hyperspace through which both of you met, that is for sure. Both of you touched each other, knew each other a little via proxy, but only you remember. Who do you think stepped and perhaps sat down on the floor before you do? Who do you think breathed the same air before you do? Close your eyes. Now it's the night. Your eyes are closed, but you imagine it's the night. You imagine you immediately fell asleep when I started reading, and you are only waking up now at night. Eyes closed, you must be picturing this place at night while keeping your eyes closed. Dark, silent, empty, but the same air, same sound, same sounds. And in the night, everything has disappeared. But when everything has disappeared in the night, everything that has disappeared appears. And this is the other night. Night is the apparition of everything that has disappeared. You open your eyes slowly and you visualize this space at night. You remember yourself describing the room again in your mind. Someone once wrote that describing something is like using it. It destroys the colors, wear off the corners, lose the definition. And in the end, what's been described begins to fade, to disappear. The truth is terrible, this person writes. Describing is destroying. Once seen, it disappears. Once owned, it's on the way. Find for yourself things, details, sounds, lights even. Find what for you, what the night now made visible in this room. It's not people, places and memories but abstractions, debris of history, stacking up abstractions we call myth. Imagine you're opening a book by night, pitch dark night. This book could contain any text and it would be written in any language, prose or verses. It's just a small object. It's not about the text. It's not about the words that are shapeless, 
and readable, probably owned by so many readers already. They got all warned and they lost mean, meaning. It's all in your head. It's all for yourself. And you're not reading. Well, you're not reading from your eyes. You try to read that space as you would read that book. Visualize it, evaluate its properties, all to do with it. Hard cover, soft cover, thick or thin pages, textured, thick, glossy pages. You read that book through your fingers, through what you can guess while touching in the night. Unsupervised. <clears throat> it was believed in the Middle Ages that eyes could see by way of sending beams of light, touching reality at a distance, like a blind person with a stick. To see and to possess is our first myth, bringing back Eurydice from the dead. Some write that it's the birth of the artistic gesture, the appearance of the real, the real object that causes the poetic image to appear. This right on the same myth that some people's speech is at the expense of others' silence. Gliding over the black haze, your side beams all hover around. What's invisible you cannot touch. Feel your eyes sending side beams through the night pressuring your ears and your eyebrows and with it sense the aftershock, the breeze, feeling of the wall at the action of the disappearance, nameless upon your touch. Feel the distance, interpret the feedback between the surface of your eye Caress at a distance. The slow peeling layers of the wall screens you can see through. Feel their material softening as you wrap, as you describe, and sharpening edges. Action of your gaze, trail as dim record of your looks. There should be a thing through time now with you and the room, as we talked about before, a surface, a face, an object. In the room, a surface where someone else's look might have fallen upon, a stray bullet, a weak looking cue, a glance sent by someone in the past, waiting to be gleaned among the debris. The impact of the look, traveling to time, left in order to be returned. And there would be a connection between you two, an agreement, a sign, a contact, where both of your looks meeting halfway, touched it each other through time. <clears throat> Without seeing each other, like scrolling on tree trends. Soon you'll be obsessed with these marks of people's passing presence on the walls and your imaginary intimacy with a nouns. Did this ever happen to you? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe someone looked at you through time 
by looking exactly where he wants to eat. In turn, you could act some on loop. Perhaps no one ever looked there. No one carries that place with their eyes before. And you would be the first sending a look from the past. A look sent to the future. A look that couldn't be given back. And if it could, you wouldn't know. But you take the risk. You touch this precise place. You touch with your eyes. You look. And doing that, you read what happened there, or what is going to happen, or you inform the future of what happened. What happened when you looked? A continuous present, beginning again and again with tenses such as past and future. And the difference is so thin, vague, ungraspable. It's like seeing a ring. You don't know if it means past of a place or the future of a place. One must be able to mentally own a space and its characteristic if one were able to revive and brighten its impressions, emulate the space and time, looking right through the place where someone else has looked, time stopped still. One should be able to mentally own such place, grasp all its informalities. Once it's own, it already leaves you should you describe it carefully and slowly lose your investment. If you have a place in mind that you own in that way, if you have a place in mind that you can read that way, you slowly describe it, use it from memory. Use its shapes, architecture, light, material, memories, close of air and ambient sound, a place of your own, and you see yourself lying in the middle of that place. It's a nice afternoon, it's warm, you're breathing with a clear and you open your eyes. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me <clears throat> well? 
Maxim, do you hear me? Hi, I'm Adam. Um, I think we are experiencing a loss of cabin pressure in the room. Um, or it's just a lack of oxygen. I'm not sure. But it seems that um, there is a limited response. People seem to be not very responsive right now. <laughs> they are, I'm telling you what I see here, which you don't see. <laughs> there is a kind of dispersal and <clears throat> general slumber. There is individuals who are horizontal or sitting around. And I don't know, it's not your fault. It's 7.30 p.m. So, what do we do? My suggestion would be that I um, look at some particular um, aspects, perhaps, of your um, reading, and you dealt with issues such as loss of meaning, or perhaps erasure of meaning, loss of meaning, when the message is sent. And there were interesting gaps between the text that we saw on the screen and the voice, because in the transmission, certain things got lost. So occasionally, there will be a word or two missing and then back again on the track. And it kind of made me think about what we were uh, already discussing a little bit earlier today, which is about this famous message sent by the Dutch queen, Emma. Uh, from this very place to Bandung, and this message was, hello, Bandung. And it made me think about another message that was sent very recently from another place to another place, which was actually a title of an exhibition uh, that was taking place, if I'm not mistaken, at Hamburger Bahnhof, and it was called Hello World. You know, and that was an exhibition in which, you know, obviously Hamburger Bahnhof made an attempt to communicate with, with the world. And to me, it suddenly sounded a little bit like the Queen Emma sending a message to Bandung saying, hello, Bandung, you know. But I'm more interested in what is happening between the moment Queen Emma sends the message and the moment it is received over there. Because the, there is a time lapse, there is a time passing and the message can get lost on the way. So that was the year 1920. And I'm going to, to read you um, a short story, uh, which was written just one year before in 1919 and published in Prague. And it was published in a, in a Jewish um, magazine or periodical that was called Selbstwehr, which translates into self-defense. It's a story by Franz Kafka, and the title of the story is An Imperial Message. So let's try to to follow this story. An imperial message. The emperor, so a parable runs, has sent a message to you, the humble subject, the insignificant shadow cowering in the remotest distance before the imperial sun. The emperor, from his deathbed, has sent a message to you alone. He has commanded the messenger to kneel down by the bed and he has whispered the message to him. So much store did he lay on it that he ordered the messenger to whisper it back into his ear again. Then, by a nod of the head, he has confirmed that it is right. Yes, before the assembled spectators of his death, all the obstructing walls have been broken down and on the spacious and loftily mounting open staircases stand in a ring the great princes of the empire. 
Before all these, he has delivered his message. The messenger immediately sets out on his journey. A powerful and indefatigable man, now pushing with his right arm, now with his left, he cleaves a way for himself through the throng. If he encounters resistance, he points to his breast, where the symbol of the sun glitters. The way is made easier for him than it would be for any other man. But the multitudes are so vast, their numbers have no end. If he could reach the open fields, how fast he would fly, and soon, doubtless, you would hear the welcome hammering of his fists on your door. But instead, how vainly does he wear out his strength? Still, he is only making his way through the chambers of the innermost palace. Never will he get to the end of them. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. He must next fight his way down the stair, and if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. The courts would still have to be crossed, and after the courts, the second outer palace, and once more stairs and courts, and once more another palace, and so on for thousands of years, and if at last he should burst through the outermost gate, but never, never can that happen, the imperial capital would lie before him, the center of the world, cramped to bursting with its own sediment. Nobody could fight his way through here, even with a message from a dead man. But you sit at your window when evening falls and dream it to yourself. So um, that was a Kafka imperial message, and not only the fact that this story was written after this whole machinery was installed here to deliver messages to East Indies, but also um, it was the time when new ideas in physics were developed and discussed, and the philosophical ideas growing from that. And I think that that this story of Kafka um, tells us something about what is happening with this message in between, and um, it is asking whether it is actually ever uh, going to uh, to arrive. So that was that was one thing, and the other thing I wanted to read is very short, and it has to do with your um, suggestion that that we should sort of think of a room and sense the room and uh, kind of see how the space is conditioning us and what sort of space we are taking in this space. Which brings us to a now classic um, performance by Mary and Alvin Lucier from 1969-70, which is called I'm Sitting in the Room. And famously, this performance was um, made as a way to uh, alleviate Alvin Lucier's um, deficiency of, of his speech, which was slightly incapacitated by his stuttering. So the text of this piece, which is then recorded, played back, re-recorded, played back, and re-recorded in one space, is slowly becoming inaudible because the frequencies of the room take over and the message is lost and erased through subsequent recordings and playing it back. But this text goes the following. I'm sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I'm recording the sound of my speaking voice and I'm going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech, with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant frequencies of the room articulated by speech. I regard this activity not so much as a demonstration of a physical fact, but more as a way to smooth out any irregularities of my, my speech might have. Okay. So, okay, 
that was uh, Alvin Lucier, and with this second quote, I would like to end my response. Thank you. Hello, how are you? You hear me? Maxim, you can hear? Hello? I, I don't think we have a connection. Or? Yes, we have. Huh? Can you hear? Can you ask him again? How are you? You can hear us? There's a delay, I think. Ah, okay, so that's that. Well, I mean, if that is a delay, I think that's very fitting, so we will just. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so, um, of course, like uh, your reading and your topic. Um, brought uh, uh, this tenérance to my mind, which, uh, interestingly enough, it's like a term and a concept I haven't thought about for many years. Uh, you know, like this idea, you know, like this tenérance, like in Derrida's uh, work, is this um, uh, term for like the possibility of a message or a missive not to reach its destination. And, uh, opening up also like the a second possibility of no letter ever reaching its destination because you actually cannot really tell when or whether a missive has arrived like as in you cannot really tell if something was communicated successfully so basically you could infer that uh, you know this tenérance is the you know ultimate destiny of any missive or any message that will just like roam like Rome, actually, it <laughs> just reminded me <laughs> of the die. Um, and I noticed that at some point you mentioned Orpheus, and uh, um, and uh, also there was this word uh, to own an ownership that kept coming back in the test text. And uh, um, there's an interesting connection there because uh, Orpheus is, or etymologically, is tied to. Uh, someone who has changed ownership, so Orpheus was probably a slave or an orphan, uh, who was, who was uh, you know, like passed on, uh, you know, like he himself was passed on through several owners or several masters. Uh, so basically, in that sense, he, he is himself this message that just like, you know, roams or wanders it kept being passed on and, uh, you know, never really reaches its destiny or its, you know, like, end goal. Um, there's another aspect of the text that I, uh, I found, I mean, this is maybe something that is implied, it was not explicit, but, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, I, I thought there was something to it that sounded like a love letter. So basically not simply just a letter, but some sort of love letter. And you know, like of course there's this saying that all love letters are addressed to the self, right? They are never addressed to others. Uh, but then, you know, like it uh, also reminded me of this um, uh, Friedrich Kittler, who, with whom I studied many years ago. He had this text in which he said that um, lyrical love, it's only possible before women learn to type. Uh, because the moment like women like l talk back, so basically the moment when they respond the letters of their admirers, then you know like lyrical love is over forever, <laughs> because you know like uh, um, you know somehow the possibility of lyrical love requires uh, an unresponsive, uh, an unrejecting object, right? Something that never never uh, is able to uh, respond. Um, I don't think that I will be able to make all the threads cohere into a proper response uh, because it's really late in the day <laughs> and we are extremely tired. So I'm just gonna give the microphone to Amit who is uh, the last uh, responder. Take care.
Hello. Um, we're all really tired, but I thought, you're, you're, one, first of all, you're a brilliant writer. Um, and the second thing is you have a really hypnotic voice, which is really dangerous, so just be careful with it. Um, I, was, I, was, I was thinking about your, I can't hear a word you're saying, but I'm sure it was witty. Um, I loved your thing about action at a distance. I was thinking about what are the conditions of a reminiscence? What, is the, what, what, are, the, what are the conditions of, of a reminiscence? And I, I liked what you were doing with time. It's obviously very complex, and I would need to read it out again, like just read it to be able to, to grasp what you're doing with it. I also felt like the experience of listening to you read your words, your beautiful words, was an exercise in mindfulness through breathing. And I've been, I'm interested in mindfulness, um, not just because I'm an Indian, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in mindfulness because it's become the new, it's become the new business discipline throughout the business world. Uh, so mindful, it's, so I, I, I say this thing to, to my students, it's good to be mindful of mindfulness. And, and what I mean by that is, um, one, mindfulness of course is the new orientalism, right? It's the new Orientalism. And, and, but more than that, if you take it into the, the sort of uh, conditions of contemporary capital, it's also a new labor discipline. And so that's really interesting to me because you're, at, you're also asking us to do these things in your talk, which I, 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 I could not do. So it was really, really interesting. So it made me think of those things. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you also sort of pose the question of what is the mental? And I think you bring the sort of the experience uh, of the mental back into uh, the, the body. And, and I, I guess for me also, I was feeling that that body is a body struggling against the capture of representation. I know that sounds formulaic, but it's, it's something that I felt. And, and oh, and you're drinking of the water and the whole gulping thing, that was really nice. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that your words reminded me of Nina Simone's song, In the Dark. Have you heard it? Huh? I know, I know. Oh, he's laughing at my like joke five minutes ago. All right, sorry, sorry, never mind. But um, do listen to the song by Nina Simone, In the Dark. I think it would really resonate with what you've written. Anyways, thank you very much.
Hello. Um, so I just want to explain uh, why I was keeping, I was trying to keep that pilot final question as a top secret. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's already not, but I was still trying to keep that intrigue because all my kitchen presentations were kind of TV series, and I was expecting that maybe somebody is thinking like, oh, what will be that final episode? So, um, as it's going usually with uh, TV series, I want to, um, mm -hmm, but what? Just present like short summary of previous series. So the first one was how old are you? And uh, as it was told already, it's the main topic. And it was my um, kind of research of old age, uh, not research, rehearsal of old age. And it was, uh, that video was made last year when I broke my leg and was um, like desperately seeking for mobility. The second one was how light are you, which is in a way also how old are you. And it was about um, famine in Ukraine in, 90, uh, in 1932, which was created by Soviet authorities. And then um, it was uh, realized at genocide of Ukrainian people. And also in the same presentation, it was about alcohol, which is the nice and pleasant way to get some lightness. Um, um, the third one was how brave are you? And it was about fear which is shortening our lives. Um, and on physical level, it makes changes in, even in our DNAs and in our cells. And um, we have that small part in our cells which is telomeres. So shortening of the telomeres is shortening our lives. And it was presented through um, protest uh, in Moscow last uh, summer. Um, and it was also about my job as journalist and my fear about doing that job, particularly in that time. I was planning that title, that question from the very beginning, but I was planning to do it more in a more abstract way, like how far you're from the beginning or how far you're from the end. 
But <clears throat> as Julian said today, like planning is for losers. <laughs> and um, the universe changed not my question, but subject inside my question. And um, um, what I was planning was changed, and uh, instead of abstract, it appeared to be situational, as it was told here before also. So now, my final question, how far are you? And
time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for the movie. I, I don't want to sound too enthusiastic because it's not fair to everyone else, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I thought that um, you presented a few poignant and interesting areas of uh, research and also filmmaking, of course. And because what I found the most interesting and what I think makes your film um, very feminist is that you took migration from the perspective of uh, the privilege to migrate because you clearly state in your film that not everyone is allowed to migrate. So you, you take that aspect but then you intersect it with age and with the prejudice that come uh, through aging and with the difficulties in the labor market and all that peppered with a deeply personal story, of course, told through the side, uh, th through the side scrolling, uh, which make it all extremely relatable. And I think that there is uh, not a single person here who didn't see some part of themselves in that, because you, you sort of universalize some aspects of. Um, the migration and the aging and being a woman. And I thought that that was very well done. I thought that was very interesting and very well achieved. And of course, from an image perspective, I was dying with it. <laughs> Please tell me that it was not, that it was not real hair. <laughs> that you didn't subject your hair to that. <laughs> but I thought that it was, uh, very interesting, in, in, especially in the context of all the other stories being told. There was a little bit of Rapunzel, you know, the fairy tale of the um, the princess that uh, braids her hair to get um, a prince to come to the castle to her to her rescue. I got a bit of vibes of that, only that there is no prince to come and, and rescue. It's a freaking Airbnb. <laughs> and, and yeah. But I, I thought that in that braiding and that unbraiding, there was an element of, of Rapunzel and the, um, the fairy tale. Only with the dose of reality. Why didn't Grandpa come back from, oh God. <laughs> Uh, but I thought that those were very interesting and uh, very well executed choices in terms of the juxtaposition of the more academic or abstract text with the uh, text next to it, which was all about lived experiences. And I thought that that was a great way of humanizing what you were uh, trying to tell, the story that you were trying to tell, and, and the material context of that story. So, like I said, I, I really enjoy this, and I'm very grateful to have been seeing it. <laughs> um, I, I have to say, like, my brain was going, okay, the, the real life experiences versus theory, real life experiences. <laughs> and, and kind of, it made me think a lot about, like, um, feminist personhood. Then I was completely um, fascinated with the hair, and I was like, oh, this is fake hair. And then, you know, the, the unraveling, and then thinking about the um, way feminists have, um, through, I mean, feminist artists, but also feminism and um, women, women workers, have in mul multiplicity of cultures have used the hair either to emancipate oneself or um, either, um, to kind of almost um, propose ways to dismantle patriarchy. And I think with hair, there's so much attached to it. And I was also thinking about braiding, braiding techniques, that braiding is algorithm, braiding is coding. So I was really thinking about like also how hair carries coded messages in particular cultures, through slavery was a way of people communicating with each other. Um, the techniques tell stories. And I was really thinking about also Ukraine and 
and then of course the symbolism of that hair and what that means when it's performed in a particular context where it doesn't necessarily belong and then the humor that is attached either laughing at someone with someone um, and also how hair is used as a way of performing national authenticity or the the destruction of authenticity as a way of like also performing citizenship um, who's in and who's out um, and I was also really appreciated uh, that you brought forward um, aging and ageism because I feel especially in the Western European context, which is an interesting context, and specifically the Dutch context, me and, 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 and um, uh, Flavia were talking about it, because it's one thing I've been fascinated with um, in the Netherlands, growing up in the Netherlands, about how elderly people, the moment that they are no longer valuable for the capitalist machine, are disregarded or like put aside and how that during COVID-19 has been something that has been so prevalent that people are willing to give up. I mean, it's this moment that you really think, oh, this is how the Dutch function during the Second World War, because they easily will give up whoever <laughs> is no longer, whoever might endanger them, or us, if I have to speak uh, as a Dutch person. And I was really thinking a lot about that, about like how also within the in art, it doesn't come up often. Everyone talks about intersectionality, but somehow age is also part of the whole cycle and is not often mentioned. And then also, my question was also um, this thinking about how far are you about, it's, it, I really appreciated that you offered us the set of questions you've been thinking through because it made me also very, it gave me certain lenses to look at the work and to think alongside the work. And I was really thinking about how far are you? And I was really thinking in coming from also having within oneself the culture where with aging one gains um, status. So then to be in the Netherlands, to be you know, losing status, I always thought that juxtaposition is quite an interesting uh, place to be in, but also how that is so much tied to capitalism. And of course, then the migration layer, that's a whole nother <laughs> uh, story that's equally tied to um, um, the use of, who's, who's useful for the capitalist machine. And in that sense, it makes, you know, for the capital, within the context of value reproduction and um, the commodification of the bodies, it's only like bodies that can work, are, can be efficient, can do the work, you know, in the most efficient possible way, um, get the visas, get the invitations, unless you're an artist. <laughs> and, and you might be able to do and come in in different modes um, of breaking this uh, system. But I was really, yeah, I, I felt there were so many topics um, that came up. And um, also I liked the offer of being able to switch also between these two realities. And sometimes they mesh together the, the real life uh, uh, um, conditions that somehow connect or respond to the theory or actually the factual perhaps your journalistic side comes in there, the factual points that tell you what we're dealing with. So thank you again for this very dense visual piece. Thank you. Um, when I came to Amsterdam um, uh, for the first time, that was in 1995, and I stayed for about eight months. And in order to um, to be able to, to study at the Apple, which I think, you know, appeared uh, en passant uh, in your film, I had to um, work because I had, not, coming from Eastern Europe and relatively humble background, I did not have means to pay the fee. Uh, neither I had means to to to, to, to pay my living while studying. So I was studying and, and working at the same time. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, my job at the time had nothing to do with uh, cleaning flats or such. Um, I was pretty useless for that, I suppose. 
But I managed to get a job which was basically transcribing audio tapes from a conference, which conference brought together maybe 50 um, programmers uh, working for different television stations in Europe, and these programmers got together in order to discuss how to best represent culture on their televisions. So my job was a service uh, done, I was contracted by the company that was contracted to, to present to organizers of the conference this transcript of, of those recordings. So at the time when I wasn't busy uh, working, transcribing these this tapes, I tried to study a bit and also see exhibitions. And I remember that in one exhibition, I, I'm tempted to say that it was Wild Walls at Stedelijk Bureau Amsterdam, curated by, by Leontine Kulvai and Martin Nievenhuisen, but maybe it was another exhibition. Uh, I saw the 1992 uh, work of Janine Anthony, uh, which is called Loving Care. And in this work, the artist is basically mopping the floor with her hair uh, dipped in uh, the loving care dye, which is called natural black. And this work is sort of by default understood as a, as a sort of uh, a re critical retake on abstract expressionism, you know, the dripping techniques in Jackson Pollock. And, and all that, um, but I thought it was actually in the context of your work to, it would be interesting to look back at it again and to look at this particular use of female hair in a performance done uh, originally, I think in the UK, if I'm not mistaken, and to see different conditions of, let's say, the, the, the use of hair and, and pointing to hair, uh, um, by artists coming from these two different backgrounds. And uh, I guess in 1993, this gap or difference between artists and people in general coming from Central Eastern Europe uh, and people here in, in the Western Europe was, was quite you know, st striking. Right now, there's a, maybe a, a little bit of a greater um, sort of mixing or blurring of, of certain boundaries, at least on on, uh, on superficial level, because the differences rem remain, and they are, I think, I believe they are defined by economy. And to, to what, I, uh, what I heard uh, from you about um, those, you know, who is, uh, who, who is of use for, for the capitalist machine, I, well, it seems every, everyone is of use, of some use for capitalist machine. There is absolutely no escape from this and of course you can be rendered useless and, and sort of uh, uh, regurgitated by, uh, by the machine but that doesn't really mean that you don't have a function in it so even those workers who are paid the lowest and the lowest pay uh, in the Netherlands for a menial job right now is around uh, 9 euro you know so um, even the, these people um, find a place and they are sort of utilized within the system that that works pretty uh, seamlessly so far despite our efforts okay that would be my comment thank you very much for showing this work last one
the deal is the last presentation of the day. So Saskia Burgraf, Burgraf, Dutch, presents Vagalton Resonance, disrupting timelines of inadequate monuments and ruins for future profit. Flavia Dodsdan, Amit Esrei, and Amal Alhag will respond to the question, how to take up space, how to make up space. a temporal audiovisual echo of our collective feedback loop and some other distortions of the locus. Preferably resisting the ordered history of patriarchal capitalism. Just in case, Saskia added some layers over our pre-shaped surroundings to see what can be rerouted. It's supposed to be a synchronous vibration of neighboring or remote object and subjects by feminist geographical theorization on collectivity, or maybe it's a remix of spatial, social, and legal organization and other contradicting senses of matter, but you're never really sure. What is certain, it's a cut-up collage to take a piece of our collective intelligence to our homes. Again. Saskia. Thank you. Um, first, a small introduction. First and foremost, I want to thank my friends and my love, Menzo Schrik, Annie Meul, Lisbeth Visee, Marianne Hamersma, Janneke Hopman for their endless support, and Menzo for the sound. The sound you will hear is recorded over the last two years of Dai. It entails very small snippets and parts of all the second years and their feedback that ended up in this big feedback loop. A small practical notion, uh, the boxes on the floor will be unopened until the end, and then you will notice what will happen. Um, I want to ask you to walk around freely, stand where comfortable, look at details or each other, listen and look around you. First, I will uh, talk uh, about, uh, have a small introduction uh, based on the writing of Doreen Massey and Sarah Keenan. Um, the conceptualized space around us, which depends crucially on the notion of articulation, is a move, a sound and an echo that in terms of political subjects and of place, that can be anti-essentialist, which can recognize difference, and it can simultaneously emphasize, echo, and resonate the basis for potential solidarities. New forms of conceptualizing of the spatial implies the existence in the lived world of a simultaneous multiplicity of spaces, cross-cutting, intersecting, aligning with one another, or existing in relations of paradox or antagonism legally designated or just a feeling of a sense of a place. Most evidently, this is so because the social relations of space are experienced differently and variously interpreted by those holding different positions as part of it. Ideas of place identity are also always constructed by reference to the past for future, for future profit or the fear or lack of that same future. The observer's constitution of it means that there is necessarily a multiplicity of different spaces within one. Or how one takes on space can claim the existence is necessary, necessarily dislocated. How we show up in a space or place matters. So take a long look around you, maybe move around a bit, zoom into details of the space, 
Do you see an area that feels like it could be a spot for you? Do you prefer walking on the light tiles or the dark? You can feel the lines, uh, you can follow the lines while walking if you want. How does it make you feel to be in the presence of other people? What does the high ceiling do to you? And the distance? How do you define this space according to your needs? What words are there for a feeling of a place or a space? And what does it resonate?
And, and, and so I was, I was also sort of sat, uh, sort of st stood there and kind of watching people and how they were interacting and wandering through the space and, 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 and how the images were drawing people, but also there was a curiosity around the boxes and people were also sometimes looking at each other, but mostly looking at the ground. And, um, but also the, the screens drew people, they drew their in attention. So I thought this whole, the whole performance kind of thing that you invited us to engage in was also a way in which we could think about how we're habituated to certain kinds of media streams and how spaces some, sometimes lose their multiplicity when, when an image stream dominates. And I thought that was a really interesting um, play. In, in that in the, in your in your piece, so amazing. I thought um, you opened up the question of the social relations of space really nicely. I thought your fr uh, sort of framing of it was really really um, nuanced and 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 also kind of an invitation to experiment with a space, which I thought which is rare. I think generally, I mean, you know, this is a colonial freaking space, right? I mean, how many experiments have happened in the space and its history? So, congratulations on that, and thank you for that. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was really, and the dancing, you know, like people just couldn't, people couldn't stop moving, and people just started, ah, oh, yeah, okay, and we're, yeah, you know, and then there was like groups that were, I know, I'm just kind of describing it. I'm being completely descriptive right now. I know, I'm sorry, a little bit. It's a little late for me, but um, it was excellent, and I, 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 I could, I could uh, say more. Um, I really like this line, the multiplicity of spaces in one. That's a really, it's an, it's an evocative line and it pushes us to think um, in, in really interesting ways. So, thank you. I echo the professor's uh, thoughts. <laughs> and I agree about the, uh, the multiplicity aspect of, of uh, the different um, sectors in the installation. I, I really was blown away by the soundtrack. I really, really loved it. I thought that that was so well executed. Not to say that the video wasn't. Uh, the video was equally compelling and um, very mesmerizing to watch. I thought that you really succeeded in creating this atmosphere because what you did at, at least for me, is you created a mood. And that's very difficult to do. I mean, as an artist, I'm sure you, you, you've you been to countless installations that create moods. And people tend to think, people from the outside tend to think that that's easy to achieve. But actually, it's one of the most difficult things to do because it's evocative and it's um, a little bit unsettling and disquieting. And you did all of those things. And, and like I said, I really enjoyed it, especially for the last thing of the day. Woman, you really need to pat yourself in the back that you made it to this and um, with something so strong. And now to answer the question, because there was a question posed, um, how to take space and how to make space. And I, I will, again, like I always do, answer in a very subjective manner, which is partially inspired fr from your installation. Uh, space is not something to take. That's a very colonial um, assumption that we need to take space or that we need to occupy space. Sometimes just doing is enough without uh, taking or without using the colonial mentality uh, that requires that we constantly take resources just because they are there. And I think that one thing you did, which was beautiful, um, was that you created space. You didn't take space. And there is a big difference because one is predatory taking space. The other one is emancipatory and can be liberatory, which is creating space. And I felt that you, you did that, and I'm very happy with what we saw. Thank you. Take multiple things off. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you um, for um, 
many things that have already been said, like you know, bringing forward um, the spatial dimension to actually um, um, kind of do some sort of spatial embodiment movement, and I appreciated that, especially when you know time has has kind of rendered our bodies almost. <laughs> If one speaks about uselessness, it felt a bit like the body has been a bit useless for a bit. So to make, um, to be in movement, um, I guess also with COVID, what does it, you know, this, this thing of being in close proximity to each other and at the same time to keep distance. And one of the things I was also thinking about that I really, um, for me, the remix aspect of like remix as a methodology, I thought that was quite interesting in, in finding ways to remix um, these small little gifts that had such a big value for kind of what they did for people to be in some sort of, to acknowledge to be in re relation as a gift, as a ritual, um, this gift of giving, um, and not necessarily did not seem to come from a place of receiving. And um, um, I, I, I thought that was really also very, um, like a, um, a moment of care came forward in there. And um, I, I thought that was also, and I guess a moment also when you're studying to a closure I associated the gift with like a moment of closure. And um, the other thing was um, looking with the visual elements, the ruin, the ruins as a creative space, as a, this landscape. Um, I mean, this, I guess a concrete jungle looking at this specifically and then thinking about um, what I felt was interesting that you found I mean, it looks like a very Dutch space. And I was thinking about how in the Netherlands, often, again, things are made efficient. So, you know, often there's renovation projects. Things happen quite quickly. So to actually find a space that nature partially took up has been, I guess, maybe uh, freed from its purpose um, was quite interesting to think alongside of um, some of the questions you pose. And um, I also thought about, um, um, in a way that these type of ru ruins are indeed, you know, maybe the, the, the type of failures we need at the moment as a way to be, you know, to sidestep um, all these, some of the topics we keep coming back to, like the efficiency of the capitalist machine. Um, and in a way, because of course they are often an expression of the infrastructure of financial thinking, specifically in the Netherlands. And then um, to kind of add on to what, uh, as a last thing, because I don't want to, you know, ramble on, but um, this question of how to take up space, how to make up space to add another dimension is, um, what does it mean to, you know, not centralize your own desires for a space or your own imagination, but to think of it as what does it mean to hold space for each other? To kind of like, if we cannot, you know, what, to not produce colonial language means sometimes also to kind of step out of that boundaries that we've set ourselves or that we're trained within. So then it means to think of it in a different way. Um, what is that type of different way of thinking we need to generate other ways of being together? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for speeding up and uh, bearing because we made it only 45 minutes late. <laughs> Which tomorrow, please not. Um, so tomorrow, uh, please, please, please come in at nine. Set up your alarm, wake up your fellows, come in at nine. And not for me, not for you, do it for yourself and for your fellows. It's not respectful not to be here at nine. Um, then I have a series of announcements to make from Jacques, who didn't pick up their bikes. Go to Jacques or Sane, thank you. Uh, sanitary items pick up 
at number 59 tonight. Don't steal each other's. Uh, and uh, I have to remind you to keep the protocol. So keep the direction, mouth, cup, don't come too close. I know it's really difficult. I've been touching a top couple of people today, right? Um, can't read this. <laughs> Close the, oh, yeah. close the front door, otherwise tourists are coming in and, and then they pass us Corona. <laughs> and again, do come tomorrow at night. Have a good dinner. I love you. Anyone also who still needs to test, this is the time to do it, to test any techie, whatever, for the upcoming days. Thank you.